After over 40 hours, I have 100% in Alan Wake 2. I got all the collectibles and achievements and beat the game on its hardest difficulty. Now let's discuss if this long-awaited sequel is worth the wait. Alan Wake 2 takes place 13 years after the events of the first game. Players start off taking control of FBI agent Saga Anderson as she and her partner Alex Casey are called to Bright Falls to investigate a series of murders. Unlike the first game or the non-canon spin-off American Nightmare, Alan Wake 2 goes full horror, starting the game off with a cult killing before everything even starts. Saga is a seasoned agent and takes the lead in this case, highlighting her interest in difficult and deadly assignments. To solve this, she utilizes the Mind pla Palace technique, which involves her sorting through her memories while remaining stationary in the real world, something other characters make note of and are weirded out by. The Mind Palace mostly serves as a way to guide the player if they're lost allowing them to build a case using similar techniques found in real law enforcement, but it's mostly just to catalog events to give players a full understanding of the events going on from start to finish, like an elaborate recap. The only option that is required is profiling, allowing players to read the intentions of certain people, but it's automatic. Saga just tells you what their motives are, so you can unlock the next dialogue option and ask the right questions. It's a very simplified version of LA Noir's system, where you just go into the uh, Mind Palace, click the image, click the following question, she gives you a dialogue, and then you interact with the character. Saga may seem like a Mary Sue on the surface with this ability, but it ties into the narrative in a very twisted way. In fact, Alan Wake 2 goes full psychological horror here, where the lines between reality and the supernatural are not just blurred, but shattered. Unfortunately, those who didn't play Alan Wake 1 or Control will likely be lost. The developers assume that you played both games and understand much of the significant information needed for this story, from the FBC, objects of power, and altered world events. That being said, Sakura herself is a capable FBI agent. Despite the supernatural things happening, she remains stable even during dire personal circumstances. The new manuscript dictates the events that will transpire throughout Alan Wake 2 and ropes Saga's family into it, causing her and the player to question what is real. Saga acts like a person. She's concerned for her family, her partner, and the innocence of Bright Falls, but often ignores some information because the thought of it is just too painful. She'll put a taken into the ground without a second thought despite knowing their people, understanding what it takes to be an FBI agent. But most importantly, what we see and hear is left uncertain due to how Alan Wake 2 is written. On top of everything, she also has to stop a deadly cult wearing de deer mask. As for Wake himself, he joins the story fairly early on. Unlike Saga's story which takes place in Bright Falls, we play as Alan as he's trapped in a dark place and for most of his journey. As the first game ended with a huge cliffhanger, we finally see what Alan was talking about. The dark place is as wide as an ocean, taking the memories of people and building an altered reality. In this case, a recreation of New York from Alan's memories that just simply feels off. Alan's living nightmare is teeming with Taken, but whereas the dark presence controls people in the real world, here Alan has a sea of them to deal with. Some remain lost and unaware, but some will attack you when they sense Alan creating large amounts of tension as you navigate the cluster of darknesses and fight back using the light, not sure which one will attack and which won't. Both stories play off one another, each building on the core narrative and eventually reaching the core goals. Alan attempts to escape the dark place and Saga tries to save everyone including her family. The issue is the narrative's ending falls short, especially for someone like myself who has been waiting for this game for over a decade. The optional content also suffers from poor finales that make the obtusely long side cases not worth the journey outside from getting supplies, in Saga's case, charms that boost her capabilities, with Alan getting no optional objectives entirely. As for answers to lingering questions, Alan Wake 2 falls into the remedy formula of answering questions with more questions. Considering how Alan Wake 2 is written, it calls into question a lot of things, even the events of control. Someone like myself likes these twisted stories, but it's definitely something you'll need to take it for what it is instead of what it's not. What makes the entire narrative pop is the mix of live action and in-game cutscenes. The incredible visuals and atmosphere create an uneasy tension throughout, with larger than life 
live performances that directly complement the main narrative in beautiful ways without breaking immersion. Remedy is one of the few big studios that still experiment like this and it definitely pays off here, with all the actors, not just poets of the floor who take on the role of the old gods of Asgard, showcasing their incredible performing talents from dancing to singing. The narrative won't win over everyone and has clearly been designed for longtime fans of the series but those who are interested in twisted psychological horror will definitely get their money's worth. Which is great, I love games that cater to a specific audience as it allows them to go beyond the expectations of what is standard, but instead focus on what the story needs. Alan Wake 2 is Remedy's first attempt at a survival horror game and they captured the essence of the genre very well here. Clearly inspired by the remakes of Resident Evil 2 and 3, the over-the-shoulder third-person gameplay is impressively strong and a definite improvement from the original game. Alan and Saga have good mobility and shooting is effective but not meant for action combat. It plays more like a toned-down version of Resident Evil 4. You're given enough speed and handling when shooting but not enough to go full John Wick. You can sprint endlessly, removing that awful sprint system from the original game, and dodging will serve as your primary defensive tactic, with a small melee attack available, but this is usually just for show, I never used it because it was really ineffective. The variety of enemies have dropped, and so has the number you'll encounter, but they're far more threatening. The developers have refined the enemies to portray them as twisted caricatures of once normal people, whereas the original, they just seem like more like comedy actors than rather threatening and creatures, going as far as to highlight their bodies being torn apart as you rip away the darkness shield using your flashlight and tear apart their flesh using guns. A single take-in can easily put you in the ground if you're not careful, and this approach makes the, the monsters a lot more intimidating. As for the differences between Saga and Alan, I didn't really notice a difference gameplay-wise. I mean, I guess Saga's crosshairs focus quicker than Alan, or I could be wrong about this, but it would make sense she is, after all, an FBI agent and he's not. Despite all the experience he has fighting the Taken, he's still a writer at its core. This doesn't mean that the enemy variety has changed a lot. Instead, it remains largely the same. The birds have been removed for wolves, and the boss Taken have unique abilities that require different strategies to take them down. Some Taken have exposed areas highlighted in red, and if shot, deal heavy damage. However, before you can deal serious damage, you need to drain their shield. Unlike the original, you have to focus your flashlight to drain a Taken shield specifically instead of just aiming and pointing your light at them that slowly drains their shield. And instead of using batteries to quicken the recharge as they normally recharge in Alan Wake 1, your flashlights, here they deplete on specific charges and cannot be replenished without batteries. Once you use all the charges and no longer have any batteries, you have to either brute force the Taken down or run away. On story and normal, Taken will mostly drop supplies, but on hard, I found that they only drop supplies under very specific circumstances, such as if you have nothing left to fight with or during a story-driven encounter where you have to fight a bunch of Taken. But on hard mode, they definitely limit your supplies. Both Alan and Saga have access to different weapons. Alan has a revolver, shotgun, and flare gun, whereas Saga gets a handgun, crossbow, two types of shotguns, and a rifle. Most of these are optional and rewarded for exploring the semi-open maps. Saga's weapons can be upgraded by finding scattered manuscript pages hidden in Alex KC lunchboxes and given special bonuses by finding charms such as increasing her health, finding more and better resources, and so on. Alan instead finds words of powers highlighted by glow and paint, but you can only choose from a specific set based on what word of power you find, and you can't upgrade everything, so you have a limited selection of which you can choose, and unfortunately there's also no option to reset any of this. The issue with Saga's upgrade system, of course, is the fact that you get the pump action shotgun at the end of her narrative, and since you can't reset any of the upgrades, you unfortunately have to deal with this type of system and just use the weapons that you've upgraded. An issue I had with the bag system as well is that you can only upgrade the bag during the finale of the game. You do get one bag at the beginning of the game within the first two hours, but the final bag you only get at the end of the game, so if you've been collecting everything very intricately, this will just be like an extra bonus while it would have served you more purpose if you got it halfway through the game. 
Saga definitely deals with more heavy hitters than Alan, which is ironic. Despite being at the center of the supernatural threat, Alan never faces anything new or even a boss fight. You'll occasionally have to run from the dark presence in a scripted event, but Remedy had an ideal opportunity to really create something unique for Alan's journey. Saga does have some great boss encounters that offer a different twist to the Taken, but most of the difficulty comes from the visual presentation as the distortion caused by the Dark Presence is the real challenge since it becomes very hard to see. Saga and Alan's story takes place in two different parts that can be played entirely or you can swap between the two. This is limited to Ati's janitor bucket that serves as a transport method, but once you reach a certain point you'll have to play the other's narrative. In addition, supplies are not shared between the two. You can store items in a shoebox that can be accessed in every safe room. Safe areas are separated into two categories. The major ones include a saving point that cannot be entered by enemies, but the other can be entered by enemies if the player attacks the enemies while inside it. Saga has optional cases to take on to complete, but these serve as just giant collectible events. You can gather hidden supplies from stashes from the Cult of the Wood, for the members, solve nursery rhymes, and gather manuscript, uh, manuscript pages, but the pages have become optional with no achievement linked to them. Instead, they serve as hints for future events to better prepare, like in the original game. There are also TV programs featuring commercials from two important tour guides, radio shows, and deer heads you can pet. It's a lot easier to gather everything than in the original game, although there are some missable options that the game does not alert you to, but there are far fewer collectibles this time around, but it can still feel like a chore since there's no quick return option once you reach a certain area and you want to leave it immediately. You have to walk all the way back to your car to go to a different area. I also ran into a couple of glitches where the map would not indicate that I collected an item, leaving me baffled of whether I got the item or not, especially when it came to the manuscript pages. To solve cases, Saga enters her mind palace to create a case board based on the evidence she has gathered. This is entirely optional and serves more to help players who are lost about what to do next, but profiling is necessary. Here you can select an image of a person and Saga speaks to herself about the logic about the person, what they're thinking, and opens the next set of dialogue options. It's also here where you can keep track of optional collectibles. Alan instead has his writer's room, where he can alter reality based on plot ideas he gathers from the environment. These are represented as echoes of Alan's character, Alex Casey, that complement the narrative Alan is following trying to escape the dark place. With these, Alan changes reality to create possibilities he can follow. This is only used for narrative purposes, but could have been used in combat as well. Maybe a unique boss fight where Alan had to constantly shift reality to give him an advantage against the deadly force. Maybe from his past or something he was guilty of. After all, the Dark Presence is all about weakening someone's morale through guilt before they can take him over. The semi-open areas include three for Saga and one for Alan. They're well designed and the map helps you easily navigate the area, but you'll have to locate the map first. I did wish you could explore more Bright Falls, though in the first Alan Wake game you were given the opportunity to fight through the entire town, but here you're limited to just a small section which is a bit disappointing. That being said, the survival horror mechanics and the overall presentation of the new gameplay mechanics definitely work in Alan Wake 2's favor. I did wish the collectibles were a bit more shortened in the sense that they were streamlined or offered a bit more payout when you gathered them all, but overall I was satisfied by the survival horror mechanics that they introduced here. It's a really good first attempt and I can't wait to see how they take the feedback from this game and maybe implement this for a future installment or maybe a brand new IP. They clearly know what they're doing and it's really impressive. Now I usually combine music and gameplay into the same category, but music has always played a huge role within Remedy Entertainment's various games and in Alan Wake particularly, the music is a very important factor in determining in the narrative. The music from the old gods of Asgard, which are featured by the Poets of the Fall, simply excels in every category, with incredible live action performances that directly complement the overall narrative and it's simply brilliant. You'll love almost all the musical tracks here. Unfortunately, I can't play them in the raw form because they are heavily copyrighted. In fact, most of my walkthrough has been copyrighted and I don't know how I'm going to upload it without 
getting some serious eyeballs on me from YouTube. But regardless, the soundtrack is brilliant, but the copyrighted music feature in the options menu doesn't block out everything. So if you stream the game, just be aware of that. Now, I'm not sure if these issues have been resolved as the time of writing this review, but I have had my fair issues of glitches and problems during my time with Alan Wake 2, even with the various patches that they updated the game within weeks of its going public. I had graphical issues, flashing lights that I won't show for people who are sensitive to that, sound cutting out or just being muted entirely, lighting problems, and this happened, which was just completely crazy because I was bypassed in an enemy that didn't spawn but apparently they were supposed to spawn and it just caused me to face through the entire map now there are just so many technical problems here that they really have to fix a lot of them but it's not that problematic but it's definitely noticeable i also read a lot of people had issues where they were soft locked out of the game for certain other issues because of the auto save function now you have two options you can manual slave, uh, manually save and auto save but most people will just auto save the game Game. so it's best to keep an optional file open just for manual saves in case you deal with something like this or you might have to restart the entire game. Alan Wake 2 is definitely an exceptional experience to this cult classic. The survival horror systems perfectly match this type of atmosphere and the psychological thriller doesn't even compromise itself for the sake of convenience. Granted this is a double edged sword so those diving into Alan Wake 2 without any prior experience for, for the first game or even control will be absolutely lost about what's going on. But if you're able to keep track, you'll find a deeply disturbing and screwed up narrative full of death and fates worse than death. The third person gameplay is fantastic and Remini clearly did their research when crafting the systems to complement this new survival horror direction. It's not perfect, especially during large battles, but the smaller encounters work very well. The developers still need to resolve the technical problems and streamline the collectible process, better to avoid making them feel like a chore. In addition, take some chances with the true supernatural elements, especially the dark place, going beyond just taken and maybe introduce some more variant creatures as seen in control, maybe mix and match some more supernatural things so it complements the dark present along with showing there are other threats out there like how control showcased not only the mold but the hiss and the objects and powers and altered items as well, you know, have some more variety to the threats that are looming over you or even introduce them in a very small way that showcase that there are bigger things that could happen if this is let loose you know some more variety to it as someone who played the original Alan Wake back when it came out on the Xbox 360 as an exclusive title and now playing the sequel it was worth the wait in every way. I loved this game. It was fantastic. A simply extraordinary game and it shows that Remedy Entertainment can go far beyond just what they're comfortable with. They're able to stretch their legs and try new genres and still execute them in such brilliant ways. If you love Alan Wake and you're holding off on this because it's a survival horror game, you should definitely try it out. It is an exceptional game, but if you're first diving into Alan Wake, I would recommend that you at least play Control, which is another exceptional game as well, but you definitely want to play that game before you dive into this if you want to get the full context of what's going on. Either way, Alan Wake 2 nailed it. It was absolutely brilliant. Thank you.